This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Chapter 17 deals with the behaviour aspects of performance management and some human resources aspects also. And in the syllabus there are two theories mentioned, uh, to some extent to do with motivation. And the first one is Vroom's expectancy model. And what this does is it attempts to say, or attempts to explain, what it is that motivates a person that gets somebody to act in a particular way and gets someone to act with enthusiasm in a particular way. So someone once said that motivation was when you get somebody to run towards a target rather than just walking slowly towards a target. And the expectancy model uh, says that the force of motivation, that's what the force is, that's the motivational force which we have in, in here, there, depends on two things. It depends on valence and expectancy. Valence is how much you want something. Uh, uh, valence, in a way, comes from a, a chemical term, uh, how, how strong the attachment is in many ways. And expectancy is the employee's assessment or of the probability that they will achieve what they want to achieve. So I could offer you, uh, let's say, $100,000 uh, provided you get 99% in the P5 exam. And you have to think to yourself, to what extent would that be a motivating force for you? You'd certainly like the $100,000, well, you'd like to get a P5, of course, but $100,000 would be nice to have extra. Uh, but the chances of anyone getting 99% in a P5 exam is, is terribly small. Uh, and, and so this is not going to work. You're, you're not going to really try that much harder because of this effort. Or what I could do is I could say I will promise you one dollar if you get at least 50% in the exam. And if you've listened to these lectures and done the questions, you have a very good chance of getting 50% in the P5 exam. But I don't think that the one dollar uh, the, 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 you're going to be that attached to it, you're going to be that turned on by it. And similarly, if you are setting uh, objectives for people and linking this to rewards, the reward, and it could be a monetary reward, uh, it, it could be uh, the chance of promotion, it could be just telling somebody well done, it could be kind of salesperson of the month or something. Whatever the, re the reward is, you have to make sure they actually want it, and you have to set the level so that they feel they can get that reward if they work reasonably hard. So we have to get them both right. So you have to put in front of people something they want, money, promotion, shares, praise, whatever, and you mustn't set the, the hurdle so high that people simply say, well, I'm not even going to bother trying because I won't be able to do it. Agency theory uh, is uh, looking at the distinction uh, between the principal, the, the, if you like, the person who owns the business, perhaps, and the agents, maybe the employees who are working for the business. And to some extent, we've got stakeholder theory almost coming in here again. Uh, the owners of the business want large profits, uh, but perhaps the employees want uh, you know, good salaries, a relatively easy time, not too much stress and so on. And if you're not careful, you get a kind of a mismatch in, in there. What we have to do is to try and bring together, here's the sort of behavior that the owners or the managers want. And we have to uh, uh, provide incentives or training or whatever to move over the employee's behavior so that the employee's behaviour uh, is uh, effectively what is going to help management get these ambitions realised. If you keep separate, then in a way the agent, who the employee, should, who should be working 
uh, as best they can for the employer will will be doing other things they'll be thinking how can I maybe escape this bit of work how can I get home faster uh, I, I won't bother trying as I won't stay an extra hour at work uh, I would rather get home and what we have to do is to try to motivate people to work in the way which is good for the employer or the shareholders or the managers. Reward schemes uh, are pretty uh, common. We'll see different sorts of reward schemes, but let's just think of a bonus and it, 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 of some sort at, at the moment here. Why are reward schemes set up? Well, of course, they are going to change behavior. If they're set up carelessly, they won't change behavior in the right way. So if I had a reward scheme, which rewarded a salesperson based on the number of units being sold, uh, all that might happen is that the salesperson reduces the selling price to generate more sales. Whereas what I really want, of course, is not just more sales, I actually want more profits, more revenue coming from it. Uh, so if I set up the reward scheme properly, uh, it, it should get people's behavior consistent with the organizational objectives and it provides an incentive it should make people work harder as i say to motivate them to run towards the target rather than just kind of half reluctantly wandering towards it you can uh, communicate what's important to the company through the reward scheme uh, important attributes important ways of behaving uh, it could be like giving good customer service uh, it could like being flexible it could be uh, like being willing to work overtime to to uh, ensure that customers are never let down and uh, so on uh, it could be based on high quality work whatever the organization thinks is very important to its success can be effectively communicated by linking the rewards to that it should uh, ideally uh, link uh, to continuous improvement. So uh, don't have the reward scheme just kind of set at the same level each year. Uh, if people get to that one year, then you can maybe make them try just a little bit harder the next year. Don't 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 increase the the hurdle uh, so much that they're going to give up. But you can keep just moving people gently into the correct way. A lot of talk has uh, gone on, particularly since the financial uh, crisis, where many people working in banks were given very, very generous rewards indeed. Uh, but essentially, uh, that was cash in their pocket, which they would keep forever. And this uh, encouraged them to take risks. There was very little uh, adverse consequence to employees if they took a risk and the risk didn't, didn't come off. The bank would lose out, but the employee would still get the salary. Uh, however, if they took a risk and the risk paid off, then that could generate huge bonuses. And uh, this idea of short-termism uh, was something which uh, the, the, the crash, the, the banking crash, uh, has been blamed on. And there are now all sorts of ideas around uh, to try to make bonuses and reward schemes to try to get people to focus on the long term. And in banks, uh, it is suggested uh, that the bonus can be clawed back, maybe within five years if something goes wrong. Another way in which you can make bonuses longer term is to give people shares or share options, uh, which they can't actually use or sell maybe until three or five years. So you give somebody a, a kind of share option. You could even set it, a, you know, above the the current selling the current share price, and this will encourage them to work towards the share price rising over a number of years. So when they exercise the option, they can make a gain. The great thing about shares and share options is that what's good for the employee, high share price, is also good for the shareholders. So so it makes the uh, reward to the employees congruent with what most shareholders are going to want. I just remind you what we saw earlier here in Fitzgerald and Moon in their building blocks uh, here. What do we like to see about a good 
scheme. Well, uh, what we have got here, again, it's, it's, it's really worth just emphasizing this here. What the company has decided up here is what's important. You know, quality, flexibility, resource, and, uh, resource utilization, innovation. These are all um, uh, aspects of behavior, if you like, or aspects of performance, which are going to be important to the company. And what we do then is measure these by having the KPIs. And then what we're saying is we're linking rewards to the achievement of these KPIs. And we want them, we want clarity, we want to know how we get the reward or what we'll get for certain sorts of behavior. They have to be motivating and it, they have to be something which we can control, which our actions are going to affect. The types of uh, rewards that we can have, uh, there are basic uh, salary uh, that isn't in any way linked to performance that's maybe not, not going to be terribly motivating other than you want to keep your job there are bonuses and profit shares and uh, as i've said before we want those to be stable transparent transparent fair controllable and so on and we can give people benefits uh, so medical insurance good pensions cars and the like uh, these all form part of the remuneration package of the person and they can be very valuable. Two technical words coming in here. There's intrinsic rewards and extrinsic rewards. An intrinsic reward is something which you get internally. So it is like getting job satisfaction. It is feeling that your skills are growing, that you're getting better, it's a feeling of getting interest out of the job. It's the feeling you get when you make a decision and the decision pays off. You've made the right decision. You get this inner glow of kind of satisfaction. That's an intrinsic reward. An extrinsic reward is one which comes from outside. For example, your salary is an extrinsic reward. A bonus is an extrinsic reward. Promotion is an extrinsic reward because it is given to you by a, a manager. Praise is a, an extrinsic reward. Admiration of your colleagues is, uh, from your colleagues is an extrinsic reward. So just two different uh, types of reward which you have here. And, and you need to really apply both of those. So people will become very, very motivated if you put them in charge of something, you give them something challenging, you give them responsibility, uh, they're allowed to, to, to make their own decisions. And when those, when those pay off, it is fantastically motivating. Certain problems can arise with the performance management systems. And this is a list which is uh, presented uh, really in your, your notes here. Misrepresentation, some of them overlap a little bit, but, but misrepresentation is basically where people fiddle, they lie, uh, they uh, include maybe sales in a period which shouldn't be included in that period uh, to get their bonus up, because maybe the bonus is really very valuable. Gaming. Uh, gaming can come in, let's say we had two divisions and there is a prize, a bonus for the division which does better. Gaming can be uh, maybe destroying the chances of the other division, not passing on information in some way, trying to steal their customers. Uh, some, some sort of unfairness is implied by gaming. Misinterpretation. We don't properly understand what sort of behavior is required. And again, maybe in banking this came up. Uh, people certainly, uh, I think there's good evidence that uh, many banks uh, lost sight of a uh, kind of ethical relationship that you would expect to see in banks. Uh, there have been scandals in setting LIBOR, there have been scandals in setting foreign exchange rates and so on, uh, so, so that basically the banks were bound to win. The banks kind of sold you a product, uh, but the banks were bound to win because of the way the product would uh, pay off. Short-termism we've mentioned, uh, again, results are easier to manipulate in short, short term, and it may be the long-term behavior which is really important in a company. 
Measurement uh, fixation is uh, really, well, me measurement fi fixation uh, is, and tunnel vision, uh, nearly the same thing. Okay, so measurement fixation is where all you do is keep the same old measures, whether or not they are still relevant or not. Tunnel vision is you just look at what's measured, this great statement, what you measure you change, and you stick to, to, to hitting these targets that you've been set, and it doesn't matter what awful performance is going on around the place. You need a well-constructed raft, really, of KPIs so that the organization behaves well on a whole number of different fronts. Sub-optimization. Uh, this is uh, where the bonus scheme or the reward scheme uh, uh, enables people really to stop effort after a certain time. You, you, you know, if you're given a, a sales budget of 100,000 units, once you get to the 100,000 units, maybe at the end of October, uh, why would you bother trying to sell more units in November and December if your bonus isn't going to go up at all? So sub-optimization is uh, achieving output, achieving uh, uh, targets which are good enough, but they might not be the best targets or the best achievements that can possibly be achieved if you kept trying. And ossification. Ossification is a sort of measurement fixation again. It's where the performance scheme gets tired, old, a bit irrelevant, yet, yet it, it, it's there. It's always been there and we're going to keep it there. We're not going to change it. If something ossifies, it means it turns to bone. It's not flexible. Here are the suitable questions for chapter 17.